five years ago, two US special agents on a covert mission were ambushed by hitmen from Mexico's deadliest drug cartel. The sole survivor of that attack was Victor Avila, and he's never spoken about what he witnessed that day. He tells us how his partner was murdered, how their own government betrayed them both, and of a political cover-up that persists to this day at the very highest level here in Washington, D.C. of February 2011, two federal agents are dispatched from the U.S. Embassy in Mexico City on a covert mission. They have been ordered to pick up surveillance equipment for an operation that is part of the never-ending war on drugs. But the senior agent has serious concerns about the route that has been chosen. I was uh, vocally uh, uh, upset because there's been a lot of security incidents and there's a lot of security issues surrounding that highway, Highway 57. The two men have been ordered to travel along one of the most dangerous roads in Mexico. It runs through the heart of territory controlled by one of the country's most powerful drug cartels. They are Los Zetas, an organization notorious for their brutality. Back at the US Embassy, Victor's concern is shared by another member of diplomatic staff, his wife. I know that he contacted people in Monterrey who agreed with Victor that it was very dangerous. I felt like I was in the twilight zone. Like, how can this be possible? I can't believe they're sending you there. Everyone knew I didn't want to go. And I was ordered. And at that point, as a government employee, you, you follow orders or you're dismissed. Victor's companion on the journey is Jaime Zapata, recently transferred to Mexico from the US on a temporary posting. Even though Victor has known him for less than 24 hours, he has quickly formed an impression of his new partner. There's a brave man out there. He was one of them. He wanted to go. He wanted to go there and be there in the front line to serve his country. The pair are traveling in a bulletproof suburban SUV supplied by their agency, Immigration and Customs Enforcement, known as ICE. The agents make their collection and set off back to Mexico City, with Jaime Zapata now driving. I was on the phone. I called my supervisor. I informed him that we had just picked up the equipment and we were on our way back. And our estimated time of arrival and entering the city would be sometime at rush hour. But the agents are not alone. They are being tracked by two carloads of Los Zetas Sicarios, cartel hitmen who are looking to hijack their vehicle. Jaime noticed that there was a long gun, the barrel of a long gun sticking out from the back of the seat. And then uh, I picked over and looked at it and I said, oh, yeah, I see that. I said, and noticed that the, that suburban was occupied for, by multiple individuals. <laughs> They get very, very close, very close. I tell Jaime, you're not gonna pull over. You're not gonna pull over. Go, 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 go. Eventually what they do is they conduct like a rolling roadblock. closest to the windshield as I can. Jaime has them on top, on top of the steering wheel like this. And I yell at them, we are Americans, we are US Embassy employees. This is a diplomatic vehicle. We are diplomats. They didn't care. They all had evil in their faces 
and in their eyes. Two shooters approach me at my window, and before I know it, they introduce an AK-47 and a handgun right here. And I um, immediately put my head back, and I went up to against the post of the Suburban. And with my hand, I hit the window to raise it. There's nowhere to run. We're trapped in the front two seats. And I could see Jaime get hit with the handgun. And then I see him get hit with the AK-47 in his leg. I went back to the button and eventually they pulled the barrels out and the window went up. And then they sprayed it with bullets. Jaime is yelling at me, I'm shot, I'm hit. I said, go, 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 go. And he, he wouldn't go, so I, with my left hand, grab the gear shift and slam it down. I push Jaime's right leg onto the, the gas pedal. The vehicle just rolls into the median with no power. Jaime is telling me that he's gonna die. I tell him that he's not, that I'm calling for help but he was bleeding profusely. I, I could not do anything to control his leg, the wound in his leg. And I see a SUV drive out, and I think that they're leaving, but it stops and does a U-turn. And two individuals come out, and they look at me, and I look at them, and they both shoot. It takes me a couple of seconds to realize that the bullets, that they're not coming in, that the glass is stopping the rounds. Um, and Partial, the, the partial vision that I had was when they stop shooting, they get in and they go. I realized that I had been shot. In my chest, here, and in my leg. And so my left leg looked like a watermelon and it was bleeding profusely. I call the U.S. Embassy, and when they answer, it routes my call to the regional security office. And the regional security office, the res receptionist, answers, RSO. And I tell her, my name is Special Agent Victor Avila. I work for ICE, Immigration and Customs Enforcement. We have been shot, there's an agent down. We need help, we need help now. I walk towards the front desk and she's on the phone and she's screaming, Agent Avila has been shot, Agent Avila has been shot. I lost it, I can't remember what I did, but um, I know that I was escorted. I started yelling, I, you know, just give me the phone, let me talk to him. I kept asking, is it, is Victor okay? Is Victor okay? Can somebody please tell me how my husband is? Within an hour of contacting the US Embassy, Victor and Jaime are airlifted to the nearest hospital. Yet even while receiving treatment, Victor does not feel safe from the assassins. 
I was terrified to show up to the hospital. I know, being a, an agent, that the cartels kill people at hospitals when they don't finish them off on the field. I know that. I've seen that numerous times. They wanted to put an IV on me. I refused. They wanted to give me a sedative because my blood pressure was very high. And I refused. The last thing I wanted to be was impaired and not be able to think straight. Eventually, a coworker of mine shows up and it was so happy to see an American. Um, and eventually everyone showed up, FBI, DEA, US Marshals, Secret Service, everyone show up, showed up to show their support. Help arrived too late for Victor's partner that day, Jaime Zapata, who succumbed to multiple gunshot wounds. Jaime was 32, one of five brothers in a family with traditional links to law enforcement. He had served his country as an ICE agent for five years. My older son went into the bedroom. He says, Mom, Jaime's dead. So that was very difficult. It was just a bad nightmare. And then just reality sinks, and, and we, we are not ever, ever going to see my son again. And it, it, it hurts very much. The head of Homeland Security, Janet Napolitano, called the ambush an attack against all those who serve our nation. And she vowed to hunt down those responsible. But instead of swift justice for the Zapatas and the Avalas, it was the start of a five-year nightmare. The number one word that I think of is, we've been failed. It dawned to us that this was bigger than what we thought. This had a lot more to do with something that I think the government was trying to cover up. On February the 15th, 2011, assassins from one of Mexico's deadliest drug cartels ambushed two US federal agents carrying out a covert mission. Special Agent Jaime Zapata was shot and fatally wounded. His sacrifice was recognized at the highest level. It was like the second day that Jaime passed away that the president called. And uh, he said, on behalf of Michelle and, and myself, uh, we're sorry uh, about what happened to your son. And, uh, you know, you have our condolences. Victor Avila was also shot. He, too, was initially treated as a hero. But within a year, that was all to change. Throughout his distinguished career as a special agent, Victor Avila had shown nothing but the utmost loyalty to his government and his country. But then he decided to search for the truth about what happened to him and his partner on that fatal day five years ago. That search has taken Victor back here to Mexico City. It is the first time he has returned since he was nearly killed in the ambush. But his determination to uncover what happened to him has cost Victor his health and his career. Victor and I had known each other for many years since we worked together on a story about a child smuggling gang. Then one morning, he called me out of the blue. Good to see you. Good to see you again. Good to see you again. Uh, welcome to Mexico. Victor wanted to talk to me about the shooting on Highway 57 and his subsequent treatment by the US government over the past five years. My duty as a special agent to them did not matter. My service, my personal service to them did not matter, and that to me is a betrayal. And he started by telling me about the row he had with his bosses at the US Embassy prior to his mission. I said, why are we picking up this equipment by, by highway, by land, when it could be easily sent via diplomatic pouch? And I was told that all of that was already explored. And uh, the supervisors decided that it was gonna be picked up by me and Jaime. 
and it now turns out that Victor had every reason to be concerned about his safety. We've obtained this internal security memo dated January the 18th, 2011, and it's from the State Department, and it mentions places like uh, Monterey, and it says, do not travel through these prohibited areas. It's not worth the risk. Were you aware of this memo? Absolutely. Um, we all received that. Every U.S. employee um, at the U.S. Embassy re received that memo via email. Two weeks after the State Department say, don't drive on that road, don't go to Monterey, it's not worth the risk, you're being sent there. Absolutely. The, um, this notice was completely ignored by my office. I challenged it so much that I asked my supervisor to approach the deputy attache, and the deputy attache, in so many words, said he wasn't aware of any security incidents. Um, and he needed that equipment by close of business day on Tuesday. Immediately after the shooting, a joint task force of US and Mexican law enforcement, headed by the FBI, was set up to trace the killers. Within days, they'd made a number of arrests. The leader of the cartel hit squad was identified as Julian Zapata Espinosa, a Los Zetas foot soldier. And there was another highly significant breakthrough. The weapon that was used to murder Jaime Zapata was identified as a Romanian manufactured AK-47. The detective work in tracing the weapon was carried out by the Federal Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco and Firearms, or ATF. They were able to trace the AK-47 back to where it was sold, the date it was purchased, and the name of the individual who bought it. Lancaster is a small suburban community situated 15 miles from downtown Dallas. It is the home of 27-year-old Attilio Osorio, known as Junior, a tattoo artist and self-confessed gun obsessive. He went to school here and then after school he had a number of, of a string of odd jobs that he worked at uh, and he had an older brother named Ran Ferry, who had been in the military. I think uh, o o Otilio had always had a fascination with firearms. And I think it was Ran Ferry approached him about helping him acquire firearms, and that's how it started. A former U.S. Marine with tours of duty in Afghanistan and Iraq, Ran Ferry Osorio was also arrested and subsequently imprisoned following the gun trace. The murder weapon was bought from a stall at a gun fair run by off-duty armory, also in the Dallas suburbs. Attilio Osorio told police officers it was meant to be his lucky gun. Its purchase cost him a seven-year prison sentence. Hi, Victor. It's been such a long time. Very nice to see you. Very nice to see you. In the five years since the shooting, Victor, Claudia, and the Zapata family have grown close. Then I think what Jaime went through. United in their grief, they decided to launch a joint legal action against the U.S. government for ordering the two men to travel on Highway 57. But the moment that they started to demand answers about the circumstances surrounding the shooting, everything changed. At the beginning, they were very nice. They would come over and the same thing. Oh, yeah, we're, we're investigating. We're, we're still trying to get to the bottom of this. Right now, they don't even care. You see and recognize how clearly the gross negligence was there. So I have the right to do that. I was the outcast. 
I was a pariah. It's hard to swallow just how unjustly Victor has been treated. And just to see the Zapatas who, you know, they lost a son. I can't even imagine what they're going through. Day after day after day, not getting the answers that they so deserve. Both families began to suspect that the government's refusal to engage with them over the shooting might extend beyond their claim for criminal negligence. Two months prior to the attack on Highway 57 in December 2010, another US federal agent, Brian Terry, had been shot dead by criminals near the Mexican border. Brian Terry was a former United States Marine who was got hired by the United States Border Patrol and worked along the Southwest border. Uh, in Peck Canyon, in December of 2010, he was murdered by what we call a RIP crew. And a RIP crew is a group of illegal immigrants um, that come across the border with the expressed intent to rob other groups of migrants. The investigation into Terry's murder linked the weapon to a far-reaching operation called Fast and Furious that involved the transfer of thousands of firearms across the US-Mexican border. But there was a problem. Fast and Furious was not a gun trafficking conspiracy operated by the Mexican drug cartels. It was, in fact, being run by the US Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco and Firearms. And it was out of control. We armed the very people that killed Ryan Terry. Special Agent John Dodson is a 10-year veteran of the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco and Firearms, at one time attached to an elite unit. We were a firearms trafficking group. We were to investigate and prosecute illegal firearms traffickers, specifically those trafficking to the southwest border. And uh, ultimately, these firearms that were being trafficked, the ones that we were supposed to be investigating and stop, were ending up in the hands of the cartels in Mexico. Dodson is also one of America's bravest whistleblowers, the man who exposed Operation Fast and Furious, the country's biggest law enforcement scandal for a generation. John Dodson worked at the ATF's Phoenix, Arizona field office for a team called Strike Force 7. Also known as the Phoenix Group, the Strike Force came up with a strategy of actively encouraging legitimate firearms dealers to take part in illegal sales. It was known as gun walking, intended to keep the criminal purchasers under surveillance so they could map out their network. The idea was to track the weapons from the US into the hands of Mexico's drug cartels. The cartel members would then be prosecuted for gun possession and for any crimes associated with their use. But in December 2010, US border agent Brian Terry was murdered by a weapon linked to Fast and Furious. And the ATF's response was to try and wipe their fingerprints. They immediately cut the ties severed the links, changed the reporting in our reporting system, denied me and other people access to the reporting system so that we couldn't make a connection for them. They were, they were doing everything they could to cover up the fact that Brian Terry was killed with weapons from the Fast and Furious investigation. And what did that prompt you to do? I made the decision that I felt someone had to know. So I was contacted by congressional investigators and um, they said they were looking into it and wanted to know the truth. So I told them I would tell them the truth. John Dodson's revelations about Fast and Furious led to an 18-month congressional inquiry. But repeated attempts to get the whole truth about this or the existence of other gun-walking operations proved fruitless. The pages go on like this forever. 
You've given us black paper instead of white paper. You might as well have given us a ream still in its original binder. How dare you make an opening statement? How dare you make an opening statement of cooperation? One of the many reports that followed the investigation labeled Fast and Furious a failed operation. It criticized the policy of gun walking to the Mexican drug cartels as marred by missteps, poor judgments, and called it an inherently reckless strategy. Despite the damning conclusions, there is a sense here in Congress that the full extent of the gun walking scandal has yet to be revealed. In all of your years, have you ever known such a refusal to pass on the information that should be in the public domain? Not where it's so obvious that there was a violation of federal law. I wouldn't want to say that there aren't other departments. Every department stonewalls to some extent. Uh, but uh, I'm tenacious. Uh, I'm going to go after it. I think I have that reputation. It's taken more time because we've had more stonewalling on Fast and Furious and gun running than any other investigation I've done. And that's over a 35 year period of time. Victor Avila is also certain that there is more to come out. He is convinced that his case, where weapons were transferred from the US to a Mexican cartel, must in some way be linked to the wider scandal. We have requested numerous times through many avenues, not just the Freedom of Information Act, for documents surrounding the attack. And to this day, I have not received one single document from the US government. It's been covered up? Absolutely is a cover up. If there is a cover up, then I reckon the best place to start is back in Texas. It was a matter of public record that the ATF had traced the gun that had murdered Jaime Zapata to a man who lived here in Lancaster. Following his arrest, Atelio Osorio pleaded guilty to firearms charges, and that meant his defense and any other evidence has never been heard in court. So the next stop was Atelio's lawyer, to see if he could shed any light on the case. So at your request, I retrieved from archives my file on Otilio's case. This file, like any criminal file, contains all the pleadings in the case uh, by the parties, all the, the legal memoranda, all the research, uh, the witness interviews I conducted, the notes that I made that derived from the discovery I was provided, uh, correspondence with witnesses, correspondence with my client, uh, just materials you would expect in any federal case. And can, can we take a look at it now? No. I think most of the material in this box is still governed uh, by protective orders or derived from protective orders. And my understanding of the orders of the court are that there, uh, to the extent there's any materials in here that might be governed by the protective order, I'm not permitted to disclose them to anybody. So I can't see what's in the box? No. Not without permission of the court. At all? At all. How unusual is it that after criminal proceedings have been concluded, that a protective order is still in place, preventing someone like me seeing the contents of this box? In my experience, it's unusual. Bruce Anton had made it clear he was not prepared to risk contempt of court and criminal proceedings by discussing the matter any further. And now my only chance lay with a formal approach to the assistant U.S. attorney in Dallas. Mr. Trombley, um, I emailed you uh, requesting some information from an evidence file. Are you saying that there is absolutely no chance that we can lift the protective order on this file so that we can see some of the information as it related to this case? So I can't go to a judge and say, can it be lifted? They're in place for a reason. But could I go to a judge and ask for it to be lifted? Yes, I understand, I understand. Okay, thank you so much. The very short answer there was that it is unlikely, if not impossible, that we'll ever get access 
to this file. Um, he just said it was not going to happen. It seemed as though we'd reached a dead end. Through the federal court, the US government had ordered that all the outstanding evidence surrounding the guns used in the ambush on Highway 57 should remain hidden from both the families and the public. But several weeks into our investigation, all that was to change. And the breakthrough came not in Texas, but at a different location which we've chosen not to identify. We received material crucial to our investigation. It included a 750-page ATF report of investigation into both the Osorio brothers. From what I was able to piece together, the report suggested that the purchase of the murder weapon had not been an isolated incident. Also contained in the files, a copy of an undercover surveillance video. The subjects, Ranferi Osorio and his brother, Attilio. They appeared to be discussing some sort of illicit gun deal. and I was now beginning to understand why the authorities were going to such lengths to keep everything under wraps. We now had the 750-page ATF report, but given its length and complexity, it was going to require expert analysis. And Special Agent John Dodson agreed to help us. His reading of the file reveals that in the months leading up to the shooting in Mexico, there was a long-running illegal arms dealing conspiracy based in Lancaster, Texas. The ringleader was 32-year-old Ranferi Osorio, who had recruited his younger brother Atilio to buy and sell guns. The file shows that in June 2010, two cars traveling south to the Mexican border were stopped and searched by Oklahoma City ATF agents. One of the vehicles was carrying several automatic and semi-automatic weapons stuffed into military duffel bags. One of these bags also contained a US Marine Corps identity tag, clearly marked with Ranferi's name and address. Despite the clear link between Osorio and the gun seizure, no action was taken. And the incident was not officially logged until nine months later a serious violation of ATF rules that require a maximum of five days. What they were doing was illegal activity, and if anything else further in the future happened, you were going to come down on them with all the strength of the United States government, all right, with a big heavy mallet, and they would be stuck between a very hard place and that heavy mallet. So had you done what you should have done, you could have stopped it if by nothing more than scaring the hell out of them and putting them on notice. But because no action was taken, the Osorio brothers' gun-buying operation was allowed to continue. Dodson's investigation reveals that three months later, a trace was carried out on two more guns that had been found at a crime scene. The record showed that both weapons had been bought by Ranferi Osorio, in one case just eight days before the crime. Again, nothing was done. And one month later, 
the murder weapon used in the ambush on Highway 57 was purchased. What your file clearly demonstrates is the Osario brothers blipped the radar long before they made the purchase of the firearm on October 10th, 2010, which was ultimately used to kill Jaime Zapata and injure Victor Avila. And that I think that report documents sufficiently that they blipped the radar of such a magnitude and frequency that something should have been done prior to their ever having the opportunity to purchase those guns that were used to kill Zapata. The trace files contain no record of any further contact between the ATF and the Osorio brothers leading up to the time the gun was bought. But we do know that one month after the purchase of the murder weapon, the brothers are still involved in the illegal gun trade. This surveillance video shows them delivering two bags of 40 guns to one of the ATF's own confidential informants working undercover. The investigation is into drugs and weapons trafficking by the Zetas cartel. And although the guns are subsequently seized near the border, the Osorios aren't arrested. These firearms were purchased out of Texas. So I know it's not Fast and Furious, because Fast and Furious was a case worked out of Phoenix. However, as it was explained to me several times while I was working in Phoenix, that this manner of investigation, this strategy, this way of doing things was referred to as the Phoenix model, right? And it had been exported to the other field offices and field divisions along the Southwest border. Okay, it's not Fast and Furious, but it's probably another case just like it. Every single attempt by Victor Avila, by the Zapata family, by the US Congress, and now by us, to find out the truth about the events leading up to the shooting in Mexico has been consistently blocked. The federal authorities say they can't comment on ongoing criminal inquiries, but those investigations have lasted for five years now, and the most senior elected officials in the land are now saying Enough is enough. Once we had the ATF report, we forwarded it to Senator Grassley, the man who has spent five years determined to get the whole truth about the gun walking scandal. The significance is that it's an outrage that that information wasn't given to Congress when we asked for it. It's an outrage that that information wasn't given to the family. And the biggest outrage is that that information wasn't followed to the rest of the people that were involved. And if those people had been arrested for violating the law, Zapata may be alive. We think about Jaime every day, and I think where he would be at right now. I think about what I can do as a mother to find justice for him. He was a human being. He was a great person, great personality. He had a great life ahead of him, and it was cut short because someone made the wrong decision. Sometimes when I go by there and I look at his picture, I go over there and, 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 and it just, sometimes it hits me that I have to, uh, I have to cry. Because I remember the, the good times that, uh, when Hyman was a happy-go-lucky uh, person. A 
After Washington, D.C., I had one last visit to Victor and Claudia to tell them what we'd discovered. This is the file that the U.S. government did not want you to see. And this is the file that they didn't want us to see either. I'm not saying that within this file are all the answers. But what I am convinced about is that there is new information here that you have been until this moment denied. That we will be able to show that there was an awareness of, an, of illegal activity with regards to buying and selling guns, but that I don't know why nothing was done. On June the 15th, a duffel bag containing weapons was found by special agents. Together we went through the 750 page Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco and Firearms report and their surveillance footage. And I explained how the ATF had known for months that the Osorio brothers were selling guns that were turning up at crime scenes. No, I'm not right It's a Papa family, man. It's gonna come to light. It's gonna come My family to light. has me. Yes, my kids have me. I have my kids. And my family. It's about this. Still don't have their son. For Victor Avila and his family, the last five years have been hell. He was seriously wounded in the line of duty, his partner killed. He was first hailed as an American hero. Then for having the courage to stand up for the truth, shunned as a pariah. Even though he now feels vindicated, Victor Avila still believes that justice has yet to be served. Now we know that they knew. And uh, although they, they've continued to deny, scade, uh, we know that they knew now. The bottom line is that the government has, has to be held accountable. Individuals need to be held accountable. No one has been held accountable for the death of Jaime and my injuries. No one. An agent was killed in the line of duty in a foreign country, and no one has been held accountable. Not the White House, not the Department of Justice, not the Department of Homeland Security, ATF. No one has been held accountable. 